people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this per a tweet from former Unified Super Featherweight Champion Michaela Mayer. I'm not fighting Eddie's new 2-0 prospect. Come on now. I told Top Rank to get me the number one contender, Delphine Pursun, for my next fight. But unfortunately, she turned us down. We went with what we thought was the next best option. Stay tuned. Hashtag Big fights only. Delphine Pissoon is the number one contender by way of the WBC. A few weeks ago, there were rumors and rumblings that Michaela Mayer could share the ring with Delphine on the premise that she wants to occupy that spot and bump Delphine Pissoon off. But now what Michaela's saying is that Delphine rejected the fight, which is a little hard to believe because it would be a decent-sized fight with a high profile. It would afford Delphine the opportunity to fight on a major platform, and Delphine herself has not been one historically to shy away from challenges. She fought unbeaten Maiva Hamadouche, unbeaten Erica Farias. Unbeaten Christina Lenarda too. More recently, she took on unbeaten Ella Mechale. She fought Katie Taylor two times. Historically, she has been one of the more fearsome fighters and fearsome punchers anywhere at or around these weights so that she can all of a sudden start shaking in her boots when Michaela Mayer. So that when Michaela Mayer comes around, she can all of a sudden becomes squirrely. It's a bit of a tough sell. Argentinian correspondent and boxing scribe, Lucia Malena. Malena. She asked her about it. Delphine Persoon, in so many words, stated that they never rejected the offer because the offer was never made. Delphine says they never even asked them about a fight. So, how could they have turned one down? Somebody's lying here. It's a classic case of she said, she said. And it all boils down to who do you believe? Do you believe Michaela? Or do you believe Delphine? In any event, it doesn't look like they're going to be fighting. And Michaela Mayer says that they're going for the next best option. The next best thing. Who could that be? By way of the WBC, ranked right behind Delphine Pursun is LM Mechaled, who dropped a decision to Delphine earlier this year on the undercard of Mayweather versus Don Moore. That exhibition match. Could that be who Michaela Mayer ends up fighting. It's a good fight, and it's a solid fight. Both fighters are on the rebound, having lost decisions in their last fights. Michaela lost to Alicia, and LM lost to Delphine. Both fighters are looking for redemption, looking to rebound off those losses, and it is a good fight, but it's not a big fight. Michaela Mayer did say, hashtag, only big fights. Well, LM Michaled, solid fight that it might be. It's a solid fight. But it's not a big fight. It's not a big fight. A fight with Bo Mi Ray Shin. That wouldn't be a big fight either. Or a fight with Melissa Hernandez. Or a fight with Kalia Karuni. Or a fight with Brazil's own Danila Ramos. You think you're reading too much into that hashtag? I think I'm taking what Michaela Maya says at face value. You're not fighting Delphine, so you're going for the next best option. The next best thing. And in your own words, it's a big fight. A rematch with My Bahama Douche, perhaps. It's definitely a good fight. It was a fight of the year candidate, and it was close enough that a second fight is warranted. My Bahama Douche does rank in at number five in the WBC's rank standings, though that is assuming that Michaela Mayer is going the WBC route. And based on what she's saying, that was the route they were already on, eyeing a Delphine Pursun fight. This division's WBC silver champion fighting Delphine and beating Delphine would have positioned Michaela to become Alicia Baumgartner's mandatory challenger. But if they're not looking at Delphine anymore because according to Michaela, Delphine turned down the fight, Who's to say they're even on the WBC route anymore? They might not be. They may pursue a different number one contender with a different sanctioning body by way of the WBA. Germany's own unbeaten up and cunmer Ramona Grafe ranks in at number one, and she is the WBA's gold champion. Beating Ramona would once again position Michaela Mayer to take on Alicia Baumgartner as her mandatory challenger, though as far as satisfying that requisite for a quote-unquote 
big fight. That's not a big fight. Nobody knows Ramona Gray. It's really not an adequate substitute for a Delphine Pursun fight, i.e., it's really not the next best thing. Ramona does not have Delphine's experience and reputation, menacing visage. Punching power. Ramona Graf is a unbeaten up-and-comer that shows some ability, though she's a far less experienced fighter than Michaela, even less experienced than Delphine Pursun. Ramona Graf only has a handful of fights. That's hardly the next best thing. The next best thing to a Delphine Pursun fight. In the IBF's rank standings, it's really not that different. The most recognizable names are the names of Michaela, Delphine, and Maiva, Maiva Hamadou. Those are the biggest fights that you can hope to make by way of the IBF's rank standings with the most recognizable names. But as stated, according to Michaela... According to Michaela, Delphine turned down the fight. So I don't know, is she about to have a rematch with Maiva Hamadou? I'll tell you what, it's going to be interesting to see who she is lands on. Though she doesn't appear to be leaving super featherweight. And she's talking big talk, making big promises. We'll see if she can deliver. Hashtag only big fights. What I said was that in 2016, Danny Garcia said that he rejected an offer to fight Manny Pacquiao. And come to find out, according to Danny, he was lying. He says he made the whole thing up. That... I was never offered the Pac-Man fight. Ask Bob Arum. I made that up just so like people like him who don't know nothing about boxing keep me relevant. And all you did with that is admit that you're a liar and a clout chaser. Then you out saying we want Danny. How do you feel about that and the fight against Pacquiao? Oh uh, man, that's a good, that's a great fight for boxing, man. Because uh, I'm not backing down from nobody. You made up a story in 2016 to fool me. Really, that's 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 what you're gonna go with. But um, I think it's a great fight, you know, for me. And uh, but uh, you know, like I said before, just be careful what you wish for, because anything can happen in boxing. You made up a story about an offer nobody made you. So that in 2022, you could pop up and say, ha, fooled you. If that ain't the dumbest shit I ever heard. Well, that's not any better, Danny. That just makes you a liar. That doesn't mean I don't know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what I'm talking about because I knew exactly who said it. And that's what I said in the video. That Danny said he was offered the Pacquiao fight, but he turned it down. All you really did with that is admit that you're a liar and you clout chased Manny in 2016. That was my video address to former champion and irrelevant boxer Danny Garcia, who in so many words admitted to fabricating certain elements of what was supposed to be a Pacquiao fight many years ago. Many years ago, Bob Arum expressed an interest in putting his guy, his then guy, Manny Pacquiao, in there with both Adrian Broner and Danny Garcia. And all of this was circa 2015, 2016. We've often talked about this here on the channel and how Broner, Broner, according to Bob, passed on the money because he didn't like the money. At which point, Bob then shifted his focus to potentially making a Danny Garcia fight. And while Bob's interest was genuine and recorded in Bob's own words, he wanted to make the fight. The part that Danny made up was the part where he rejected an offer from Bob. According to Danny, he didn't reject an offer from Bob. He made all of that up so that, in his own words, he could stay relevant. He's basically saying Bob never offered him the fight. That bit of it, that bit of it he made up himself. The bit where Bob Arum offered him somewhere in between three and four million dollars in 2016 to do the fight, Danny, in his own words, when he spoke to Marcos Villegas all those years ago, he said he rejected the offer. Six years later, he admitted there was no offer. He made it all up. Proof positive of what I've been telling you here on this channel all along. Whenever you see these PBC fighters start talking about some other fighter, that's with some other outfit fighting on some other platform, some other side of the street. Because they do this a lot in case you haven't noticed. This is not an isolated incident. This is not exclusive to Danny Garcia making up tall tales about offers he never got. So he can stay relevant riding Manny Pacquiao's coattails. When Alara incessantly brings up the name of a Gennady Golovkin instead of moving up in weight and taking him on. When Danny Garcia makes up a story about a Pacquiao offer that he never received so that in his own words, he can stay relevant. When a Deontay Wilder incessantly brings up the name of an Anthony Joshua also that he can reject 
a hundred million dollar offer to take him on in a multi-fight engagement. A transatlantic one that satisfied what were some of Wilder's demands. One fight in America and one fight in the United Kingdom two-way rematch clause. Also that he could reject it. One of Stephen Fulton. Guy at Super Bantamweight, unified champion there, starts talking about an Aoya Inoue, who's with Top Rank and ESPN. A Bantamweight champion, an undisputed one, that's buzzing right now due to the dominance he has exhibited across three weight classes. When you see a guy like Stefan start talking about an Inoue. I mean, Danny Garcia's recent admission of making up that entire story in 2016 is confirmation of what I already knew. That six-toed freak would have been better off saying nothing than saying that dumb shit. Because you just confirmed what I already thought, what I already knew about you, your PBC stable mates, and how you regularly name drop fighters that are buzzing more than you are so that you can ride their coattails with no intention of actually fighting them. Oh, rest assured, Bob was interested in doing a fight between Manny and Danny, but the bit of it Danny made up, instead of making up stories about offers Bob didn't make you, why didn't you get him on the phone? Have your people call his people so you can do an actual fight. And develop an actual buzz. Instead of these lame brain shortcuts Al Heyman coaxes you guys to take. You often hear it said that many of these guys, what they're doing, is following the Mayweather blueprint, but you tell me which one of these guys turned out to be Mayweather by following that blueprint. Certainly not Danny Garcia. He was the welterweight division's whooping boy for the PBC. He lost to every top tier welterweight he ever fought. Keith, Sean, Errol. So he clearly didn't go on to be Mayweather by following the quote unquote Mayweather blueprint. We know he didn't make the kind of money Floyd made. He certainly isn't having the same career that Floyd had. None of those clout chases that the PBC developed into a Mayweather. If Al Heyman, if he were really the wizard that he's made out to be, he would have duplicated the success that he had with Floyd by now. He had an entire stable of fighters to groom into a Floyd, but not a single one of them went on to have the same career that Floyd had or become the same kind of draw. These lame brain shortcuts have a lot to do with that, you know. Because that's what they are. Shortcuts. Instead of making up stories about Bob Arum and Manny Pacquiao, why don't you just fight the fucker and develop a buzz the old-fashioned way? When you see a fighter like Naoya Inoue, begin to develop a buzz in the West, and all of a sudden, a Stephen Fulton starts taking an interest in him, starts mentioning him. The guy who can't sell out a high school auditorium. He spends a year talking about an Inui fight, only so that when Inui is on the eve of moving up in weight, Stefan can decide it's time for him to move up in weight as well. It's time for him to have a rematch with a guy that he already beat, not even for a full title, an interim title. Well, at least now you know what's going on. Much of this you already knew, but Danny's own comments serve as confirmation. You're trying to use the names of fighters that are being promoted way better than you are to develop a buzz. And it's not even working. But that's what you have to resort to when you're a Heyman fighter. That's what you have to do because Al Heyman has become more synonymous with fucking up fights than making big ones. He's an obstruction artist. You don't have to wonder anymore if Ring IQ is pulling rabbits out of a hat when he says that guys like Danny Garcia are, in fact, coattailing the names of other fighters. Danny just confirmed it. I don't know what he thought he was doing, but that's what he just did. Comes as no surprise to me. A clever man could have connected those dots and put that together. A clever man. But many of the PBC's cult followers are less than clever. They're brainwashed. Stupid and underdeveloped minds. Inferior intellect. It'll probably take them about three days to realize that Danny would have been better off saying nothing than saying what he said. Making that admission, because if that reflects poorly on anyone, it reflects poorly on him. You think you're making somebody else look bad saying that. And just in keeping with the PBC and their stable of clout chasers, David Benavidez <laughs> extends promotional pact with Samson Lukowicz boxing. And in doing so, he continues to isolate himself from the rest of the sport. And we well, can't have any immediate plans to move up to the light like, heavyweight division if he has re-signed with Samson. Samson Lukowicz, who revealed the interim WBC world super middleweight champion David El Bandera Roja. Benavidez has again renewed his exclusive multi-year promotional agreement with Samson Boxing. We have that many more years of soft matchmaking to come. Yay! I'm very happy to be able to continue this journey with El Bandera Roja, said Lukowicz. David is in line for many big fights that will define his legacy as one of the greats, and I'm very proud to be his promoter and for all he has already done and all he will do 
in the near future. You mean stalling out fights instead of long overdue and expecting two times as much credit for fighting the same guys that Canelo already beat? Stuff like that. The Phoenix-based slugger will face former champion Caleb Sweethands Plant in a final WBC 168-pound title eliminator in March to decide the mandatory for world champion Canelo Alvarez, currently deep in training for the match. Benavidez says he's happy to continue his promotional relationship with Lukowicz. I feel great re-signing with Samson, he said during a break. I'm happy to continue with him and very appreciative for his help building my career from nearly the beginning. Father and co-manager and trainer Jose Benavidez says he's thankful for the well-known promoter's work on his son's career. Irrespective of how you feel, David Benavidez re-signing with Samson Lukowicz, whether you're for it or against it, it does mean certain things, and one among them is that he can't have any plans, any immediate plans, to move up to light heavyweight if he re-signed with Samson. Samson doesn't have any prize stallions in that light heavyweight show. The PBC as a whole don't have any champions. In order for David, if it were his plan to move up to light heavyweight, to campaign as one, he would need to change his decorum. He'd need to go to top rank. And he's clearly not about to do that. He, he being Samson Lukowicz, was the first to believe in David. Now, everyone wants to sign him. The reason we got those belts is because of the work he put in. We're super excited to continue this journey and to be able to get these big fights. The team that achieved the youngest super middleweight champion of all time is joined contractually and as a family, said Benavidez co-manager David Garcia. I'm looking forward to David achieving more than he ever has in the coming years. So the reason that he got those belts is because of the work that he put in. What's the reason that he lost them? <laughs> Ridiculous. Canelo Alvarez more or less laid out his schedule, his itinerary for the coming year. A tune-up kind of fight in the first or second quarter of the year, and then a Dimitri Bivol rematch, a Dimitri Bivol showdown, thereby ruling out a potential showdown between himself and the very irrelevant David Benavidez. So David, David, if he wants to develop a buzz. David, if he wants to try and grow into any kind of a draw, he's going to need to keep a busier schedule next year than he did this year, because all he did this year was take on an overmatched, over the hill, David Lemieux. He must be happy with that kind of matchmaking and that kind of schedule if he re-signed with Samson. Though as happy as he might be with that kind of matchmaking and that kind of schedule, that's not how you groom a potential star in the sport. That's not how you groom a potential marquee attraction, a big draw. They'll need to do better for David next year than they did this year because all Samson did this year was put him in there with David Lemieux. Whatever. David turns out to be or not to be, he will have only himself to blame because he made the decision to re-sign with Samson. And whether or not that was a wise decision, only time will tell. Here today, David Benavidez is not a household name. He's barely active. And for better or worse, he has so left his career in the hands of Samson Lukowicz yet again. And it is what it is.